Aren't you thankful that you have a God that is the author and finisher of your faith? You know, um, in these times we need encouraging words, and I, I, I love that song, Don. I really do. That song came out just a few years ago. It's, it's, I guess by now it's old hat, but, uh, but it's still a, a relevant message, I think, to each and every one of us who are in the church, who are, those of us who are in Christ, and I'm thankful for that. The psalmist David was thankful for a God of mercy and a God of grace as well. If you would, take your Bible and turn with me to Psalms chapter 30. Psalms chapter 30. I want to read just, a, uh, just the first five verses. And uh, Several commentators say that uh, the Psalms 30 is probably, perhaps, one of thanksgiving from first to last. Uh, it speaks of deliverance from great danger, and we know that David found himself in great danger on several different occasions, uh, either in the danger of the sin that he had committed and the judgment of God, or physical danger of suffering death at the hand of Saul or those who were pursuing him. But in this passage, in this psalm, David contrasts the difficulties uh, that were simply momentary in this life, and he compares them with God's lasting favor. Friends, I want you to understand something. All of the, the things that we go through in this life, I know that light's flashing and that's bothering some of you, okay? Uh, all of the temporary difficulties that we face in this life are, are, but just for a moment, they're temporary. They're temporary. But there is something that's eternal that for those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior can look forward to attending. You see, the Bible teaches us that when we die, Paul says, uh, for to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So each and every one of us who are alive in Christ are alive unto eternal life or everlasting life. David recognized that all the way back in the Old Testament. So if you would, let's turn Psalms chapter 30. Beginning in verse 1, it says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave, thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks unto the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but a moment, and his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer once again. Lord, we praise your holy name this morning. Lord, we praise you for the eternity that you've prepared for each and every one of your children. We praise you for the place in which you're sitting today, that you're preparing for each and every Christian, each and every child of God. And Lord, we praise you that you give us the strength to endure the trials and temptations of this life with the promise of a better life to come. And Lord, we pray today that each and every person in this place that hears this message today or this week, Lord, that they would be encouraged in their relationship with you, or Lord, that they would come to know you in a personal saving knowledge. Lord, once again, we thank you for your grace of which we're saved and your mercy. Lord, I ask you to lead us and guide us into your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, verses 1 through 3, if you'll notice this, it's David's praise. It's David's praise. But if, we, if you look to verses 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5 tell us why we are to praise God. But more specifically, I want you to look at verse 5. Because, you know, I think this is where we so oftentimes, we become overwhelmed or overcome in this world that we allow this world to, to close in on us or to encapsulate us into this sphere. And I don't know how many of you ever, ever watched the movie that came out back in, I believe it was back in the 80s, called The Bubble Boy. Y'all remember that movie? 
It was, it was uh, the plot of it was this little boy, he had this uh, disease in which it had affected his body that he could not, uh, he could not, he could not sense public touch. He couldn't, he couldn't be around anybody publicly because of the condition of his health. Uh, his immunities were very, very low. And so literally they had this plastic ball that he walked around in. Folks, that's what Satan tries to do to each and every one of us who are believers. He tries to encapsulate us to keep us from the touch of fellowship, to, to help or to hinder us from the touch of God. But we know that there is no valley that God cannot reach down in. We know that there's no mountaintop that Satan can put us on or a pinnacle in which God cannot affect our lives. So David says in the fifth verse, regarding God, he says, For his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. You know what? First of all, this is a picture of God's mercy. God's mercy. You know, some of you ask me, how are you doing? And I say, well, better than I deserve. I used that phrase just this last week. I met a gentleman, and, and I was a little concerned for him. He was walking down the road, and it was one of those days in which it was pretty cold and nasty outside. Uh, one day he came down pulling a wagon, and in the wagon he had a bucket, and in the bucket he had a fire. He said, I'm, I'm just out exercising. I said, well, I was a little concerned for you being out in this cold weather. He said, well, I, I've got my fire with me, so if I get real cold, I can stop and I can warm up. But he asked me, he said, uh, how are you doing? Of course, I, I said, uh, uh, the first thing, I struck up the conversation with him. I stopped and rolled down my window and said, are you okay? He said, sure, how are you doing? I said, man, I'm better than I deserve. And he looked at me and he said, oh, no. He said, surely you deserve, uh, surely you deserve better than what you think. I said, no, I don't. You see, I deserve death. But because my Lord died on the cross... I have eternal life. David recognized God's hand of mercy. He recognized God's grace that he bestowed upon him. And so David says ultimately that we need to rejoice in the Lord. The wicked rejoice in calamity. You know, Satan, he loves to, to mock Christianity and to, to belittle Christians. That's what the wicked do. They look at you when you're in a moment of despair or distraction or distraught, and they say, oh, listen, look at old be sister better uh, than so-and-so or brother better than so-and-so over there. They're supposed to be a Christian, and they're going through the same trials and things that I'm going through, or they're going through worse than I'm going through. But the reality of it is, is that we can rejoice because we can rejoice because God has given us deliverance. We need to remember that. In the very times of despair and distraction that Satan throws our way. The Bible tells us that Satan is walking about as a roaring lion and seeking whom he may devour. It warns us of the snares or the traps that he lays in our path to cause us to trip and to stumble. Now Satan does that for two purposes. First of all, to put us in a pity party. I mean, we know how we are. Human nature. We get in a, in a, we get in a rut. And uh, it seems as if the further we go in that rut, the deeper it gets. And the deeper it gets, the harder it is to climb out of. Listen, I, as your pastor, I go through those things. I know that many of you do too uh, as well. Satan rejoices when we're in those ruts. But God allows us a means to escape the wiles of the devil, as the Scripture calls it. Now, David, in his rejoicing, remember I said in verses 4 and 5, he tells us why we're to praise the Lord and why he is praising the Lord. Because David, David says this, notice in verse 4, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints, and give thanks unto the remembrance of his holiness. If you look back to verse 2, 
O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, verse 3, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. David recognized that God could heal him or had healed him from his personal sin. Friends, let me tell you something. There's no greater reward that you can experience in this world than to know your sins are forgiven. David had his sins forgiven. We look back at David and we know that according to the story that God wouldn't allow David to, to build the temple because ultimately he told David, he said, you've got blood on your hands. We know that David committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba. He committed murder with Bathsheba's husband. The result of that was, was uh, chastisement in regards to David and his sin. But even with God's chastisement, he recognized God's mercy. And he realized that that mercy provided a healing. When I say that I'm better than I deserve, it's because I've received God's mercy. I've accepted by grace salvation. God has God is extended that opportunity to me because I once heard the gospel and he does with each and every person who hears the gospel and responds accordingly. They receive his grace and in, in essence or in return they, in, they receive his mercy as well. And that provides healing. Some commentators say, well you know what, David at some point uh, evidently had to experience some sickness or some, some disease that God had brought him through. We don't have a record of that in the Scripture, but we do have a record of David's sin and the forgiveness that he received from God. David received forgiveness from God because ultimately his sin brought him to a point that he had to repent or brought him to a point of penitence in which he turned back to the Lord and he cried out to him, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. So we see in essence in this passage a picture of God's mercy. Secondly, we see a picture of David's personal faith. A picture of David's personal faith. For that reason, that word extol in verse 1 means praise. Praise. We can praise God because he's brought us up out of the depths of sin unto eternal life. Now, friend, let me tell you something. That personal faith is pictured when we show sympathy with men and ultimately gratitude towards God. Because it teaches us ultimately to trust Him in faith. Elsewhere, the psalmist David says in 86 and verse 13, he says, For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. If you look back, that word hell in, in chapter 86 and verse 13, and uh, ultimately it, uh, it is translated from the Greek, or from the Hebrew rather, Sheol. Sheol in the Old Testament was a picture of the grave, or the abode of the dead. C.I. Schofield, who he didn't write the Bible, but he put out a study Bible, C.I. Schofield writes in his notes that ultimately Sheol in the Old Testament and Hades in the, in the New Testament are relative to each other in that they both represent hell. If you notice what it says in verse 3 once again, Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down into the pit. But the first part of that verse, and this is the important part, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. That word for, for grave is Sheol. David understood that because he had received forgiveness, that God prevented him from self-destruction, from sending, himself, sending himself to hell, to the grave, to Sheol, to the place of separation, the abode of the dead, the place of spiritual death. 
And the result was ultimately a godly reward. You see, when people look at us and they hear us proclaim the good news of the gospel, then they in turn, they see the joy of the Lord in our heart and in our lives. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Now last week, I know I had several of you to call me and I expressed this Wednesday night. About midway through the message, I began getting a migraine and I could feel my right eye begin to twitch twitch, and uh, I could feel my, my uh, eyelid begin to close, and so I didn't fail to stay around in fellowship with you. Some of you thought there was something wrong with you. But, well, there was. I had a headache. But friends, we all at some point, we all at some point still need to remember to praise God. We know the scripture teaches us that a worldly sorrow leads to death. But a godly sorrow leads to life. And Jesus promised that he would give us life abundantly when we come to know him as Lord and Savior. And that's the godly reward that comes from a personal faith. We literally are made children of God. We we have been adopted into the family of God. Our citizenship has been moved from this world of strife and discontent, destruction, and despair. And now our names are written eternally in the Lamb's book of life. This passage, especially in verse 5, is a part of that godly reward. We can rejoice. Remember, this is all about rejoicing. We can rejoice because, as David says, That sorrow that we experience in this world is only temporary. It's but for a moment. For his anger endureth but for a moment. That anger of the Lord ultimately speaks of his chastisement. And we know that that God chastises those whom he loves. We know that when we sin, we we cannot say, listen... I deserve to get uh, uh, by just this one time. Listen, I, I didn't mean it. It wasn't really that serious of an offense. But God chastens those whom he loves, much like we chastise our children when they disobey us or when they, when they do something that we've taught them differently. God chastises us because he loves us. But those words, those words that we find but for a moment, literally that word moment means wink. Wink. Now I'm not going to ask you to wink at me. But as I'm looking across here and I'm looking at your faces, there's not a one of you in here at the very moment since we entered into here that has ceased to blink. It's something that we do inadvertently. We do automatically. We don't realize that we do it. Has anybody ever sat down and just tried to count how many times your spouse or your child winks or blinks? It's just like that. The Bible speaks of another day in which there will be a wink. In which Jesus Christ will come back. He will appear and the Bible calls it a twinkling of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, he's going to reappear. He's going to gather the saints, all of those who are children of God, into their eternal abode. Just like that. That's why it's so imperative that we as Christians proclaim the gospel because people so often, more times than not, when you talk to them about their relationship with Christ, when you talk to them about repenting of their sins, when you talk to them about receiving forgiveness, so often they say, I've got plenty of time. We can look at the world today, and the world is living as if they have a thousand more years, and we may well do it, but I can tell you that we're one day closer today than we were yesterday of that twinkling. Twinkling. 
of an eye. And though we go through sometimes the chastisement of God for our disobedience, or though we have to endure trials or temptations that the devil throws our way. This passage in verse 5 says, But joy cometh in the morning. That twinkling of an eye. And that wink. Or in that blink. One of these days, Jesus is going to return. Let me remind you what the Apostle Paul told the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians in chapter 4 and verse 17 and 18, he says this, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not on the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Apostle Paul understood, listen, the best was yet to come. For the believer, he told the church at Rome, he said, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Christian, I want to encourage you with these words. Last week, I wanted to, encu wanted to encourage you as a Christian to simply be the church, to do those things that the church is called to do until he comes. But let me remind you that we don't have much more time in which to do it. Because in a twinkling, or in a wink, Jesus is going to return. For But joy cometh in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night. And I know if you're like me, you weep for your family. You weep for those neighbors. You weep for those, for those friends that you know don't have a relationship with the Lord. At least as a Christian, you should. You weep because, listen, you weep for your sin. You weep for your trials. But joy cometh in the morning. Friends, you can't praise the Lord for eternal life, for His mercy and for His grace, if you've not yet received it. So I want to ask you this morning in closing, do you know the Lord? You know, Jesus Christ, who came and presented himself as the lamb without spot and without blemish and was sacrificed on Calvary's cross because for the remissions of sin, the shedding of blood was necessary. For the satisfaction of God's judgment and for the escape of his impending wrath, Jesus died. He took the wrath of God upon himself for our sins. And the Bible tells us that if, we'll, if we will believe that he did what he said he would do and that he was who he said he was and place our hope and our trust in the accomplished work of Christ on Calvary. Call upon his name, repenting of our sins, then we shall be saved. And though in this life we may weep, 
it's but for a moment. But joy cometh in the morning. Do you know him? Christian friend, let me tell you something. I know that you're going through trials. I know that perhaps some of you may be stuck in a rut, and the further you go, the deeper it gets. But David said in verse 3, O Lord, Thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down into the pit. Live with hope. Proclaim the good news. Repent of your sins. Because if you don't, you can expect chastisement from God. But give Him the praise that His mercy endures forever. Let's stand together as we pray. Brother Don, if you'll come and lead us in song here in just a moment. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we do thank you for this day. And Lord, we give you the praise. Even though, Lord, we sometimes may suffer chastisement, Lord, when we repent of our sins, once again you restore the joy of salvation. It's unspeakable and full of glory. And Lord, as we go through this life till you come, let us rejoice in you and praise you for all that you have done and Lord, you continue to do. For the souls that continue to be saved as a result of the promise of your word. through the moving of your Spirit and the drawing of men unto you. Lord, we recognize today that time on this earth is waning. That your coming is getting closer and closer and closer. And Lord, when you come, let us be found faithful in being who you would have us to be and doing what you would have us to do so that we may hear those blessed words well done thou good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful over, to, over a few enter into the joy of your Lord Lord once again we praise you and we thank you for your grace and for your mercy in Jesus name we pray Amen.